Okay, thank, thank you very much uh, for coming to this uh, discussion forum. Uh, for the one that do not, not know me, I'm uh, Robert Nazi, I'm the Deputy Director General for Research in, in C4. And uh, C4 is, is behind this uh, Global Landscape Forum number three uh, with uh, several other implementing organizations. But uh, when I'm not the Deputy DG in C4, I'm also interested in the issue of uh, forestry, uh, forestry research and forestry management. And that's why I'm very pleased to see this room full when we are going to discuss about the, the management of and retaining the Natu restoring natural tropical forest and, and mainly the issue of how, how can we ensure that uh, they are sustained, they sustain the provision for goods and services and, and at the same time they are conserved and they still exist for our children and grandchildren. I will not be long, I will just ask uh, Pino to come and take the floor. He will uh, introduce the, the, presen the presentations uh, and then uh, we'll have after four presentations, four or five, five presentations. Uh, we will not have any question after the presentation. We'll have a, a, a series of a panel moderated by Barbara at the end. Pino? Uh, thank you, Robert. So uh, let's start. I've, I've uh, prepared a, a short presentation to introduce uh, this uh, discussion forum. And then I will leave the moderation uh, to uh, Michael Klein. Uh, as Robert said, that uh, we will not allow questions just after the presentation, but at the, at the end of presentation. And we have to have at least uh, half an hour for discussion and, and sharing ideas. So let's start. Okay, uh, just to fly to explain why managing and restoring tropical forest matters. First of all, why we are talking about tropical forest. The first reason is that tropical forests represent 50% of the world forest. And they also gather 27% of the terrestrial carbon stock of our planet. And they are also very uh, species diversified as they gather uh, more than 50% of the terrestrial, terrestrial species. However, deforestation is still concentrated in tropical region. This map shows you that the red countries, which are country from the south are losing every year uh, forest, while northern country, European country, and North American country are gaining uh, forest. And according to the last um, assessment of FAO 2015, the uh, deforestation rate was 8.8 million hectares per year for the period 2010-2015. We will we will talk about management, we'll talk about logging, selective logging. And um, a lot of uh, ecologists consider that logging is degradation. If you look at this kind of logging, of course, that's pretty degradation and very hard degradation. However, if you, uh, if you implement some uh, techniques that, uh, that aims to reduce the, lo the, the logging damage that we call reduce impact logging, then the picture is quite different. And you can see that this is maybe not degradation, but only disturbance, which is actually quite different. So uh, definition as well matters. When we talk about forest management, we also talk about the diversity of factors. Who are managing the forest? You have the forest companies. You have also small farmers, like in the Amazon. And you have also forest communities. So uh, a diversity of factors and all these actors are also interacting. So there is a diversity and complexity of factors that forest management practices uh, must uh, take into account. What we would like to uh, discuss uh, during this forum and the main challenges that we would like to discuss is the challenges with about what is forest degradation, what is forest management and restoration. What is the future role of tropical natural forest versus plantations, what would be the providers, uh, what will natural forest provide and what plantation will provide? Um, how can we think a production of goods and a maintenance of environmental services and integrating the diversity of actors, their interest and their different perceptions? And then I think that uh, as uh, we are in a global landscape forum, of course, forest management 
cannot be uh, separated from landscape uh, use planning. And when you talk about, when you think about forest, you have to think about uh, landscape. Now I leave uh, Michael to introduce the other speakers. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, Plinio. My name is Michael Kleiner. I'm working in the UFO headquarters in Vienna. And I have the pleasure to introduce you to uh, the speakers. And then we have then a whole round of uh, um, 40 minutes of presentations followed then by discussions. First of all, I would like to ask the speakers here to, to come to uh, the panel. First, Ms. Isabel Garcia Drigo, please, from FSC International. Uh, Mr. Alan Carsentry from Research Director of CIRAT, please. Michael Galante, first expert, please, as the third speaker. And then, Mr. John Stanturf, U.S. Forest Service, and Mrs. Stephanie Mansurian, environmental um, consultant, uh, working for UFRO. Right, these are our speakers, and uh, of course we, we have agreed with the speakers that we have 10 minutes, yeah? So we have three speakers with 10 minutes, and then we have a, have a, a joint um, uh, this, um, presentation by the UFRO group. Uh, so we would like to um, go by region. So we would like to ask uh, Ms. Isabel Garcia for uh, her presentation on Latin America. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Bon dia. Bonjour. Uh, thank you. I would like to, to, to thank CIHAD and C4 for the invitation. It's an uh, opportunity to, to give some uh, uh, some information, some uh, and to share some uh, uh, issues regarding forest management in Brazilian Amazon. So uh, I will I will speak uh, very quickly about FSC certifi certified forest management, uh, the current status and some challenges. It's, uh, here. So uh, I go quickly there. So uh, just to uh, to show you uh, a little bit the scenario. So we have the forest lands to legal logging, the availability of forest lands to legal logging in Brazil Amazon. We have few or known private lands available. Uh, it's because the uh, property rights problems with titles and land grabbing and so on. So forest concessions are the hope. And you can see that until uh, 2015, we have uh, uh, 1.3 million hectares uh, already granted in forest concessions. Uh, so we have, uh, in average, uh, 44 uh, hectares by year uh, available for, for legal logging. About certified forest management. So this is the, the, the scenario. We have uh, 1.6 million hectares uh, certified uh, in Amazon, so natural forests. Uh, plantations, certification of plantations is more, is more important in, in Brazil. So you can see the, the number uh, because uh, uh, plantations forest sector is, is more uh, organized, uh, there's no problems with uh, land property rights, and there is a, a concrete uh, economic incentives to, to be certified. Uh, nevertheless, we have uh, 12 companies certified in Amazon, six communities, and one uh, managed government area. It's a, it's a state forest governed, governed uh, directly by the state government of uh, Acre State. So, in total, we have this, this amount of forest certified, and we can see the glass how full. Uh, so, uh, indeed, we, we had uh, an, uh, progress, some progress. Total certified uh, area uh, has grown with uh, forest concessions. We have a potential production of about uh, one million uh, cubic meters by year. Uh, we have 18% uh, uh, of the total of the forest concession area granted already certified, and the potential to FSC is spend in forest concessions, about 1.6 million hectares if all the, the concessions uh, available to, to be granted uh, you occur. Or we can see the, the half, the glass half empty. 
So, full five forest concession contract requirements is not for everyone. So, it demands uh, companies uh, uh, made uh, some uh, important investments to build holds, uh, to engagement with, with the communities, uh, to invest in social uh, issues. Public agents are still too slowly to solve some contract problems. For example, if, you have a, if we have a contestation of the, the forest concession, or if you have problems uh, between uh, different government uh, departments, uh, SEMIBIO, that's the organism that will uh, take care of the, the national forest, and service Brazilian forest to have to take care of the concession. So it's a, a kind of a administrative problem. And FSC certification is costly. You, I, you know, you know very well this. Uh, it demands a, a lot of investments uh, in training uh, and in investments uh, to engagement with uh, the communities also. And the deficit of labor force, well trained to perform reduced impact logging activities, it's a problem for the companies and it's a problem for the government also because uh, forest concessions, the contract of forest concessions demands that all the, um, all the good practices are, are really uh, performed. So, and social and technical performance of subcontractors is questionable. Subcontractors are the small companies that provide some kind uh, of services to forest concessions. Uh, for, for instance, the transportation of the workers or even the, the, the technical activities. And, you know very well, uh, unfair competition of the illegal logging. So the Brazilian, the domestic Brazilian market is, is, is um, buying, uh, Illegal logging made legal by the, the laundry of the documents. It's, that's the reality. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabel, for, for this uh, presentation. Uh, we move now to Africa, and we would like to invite uh, Alan Kassenty, the director of uh, CIRAT, the research director at CIRAT, about uh, the situation on sustainable forest management in Africa. Please, Alan, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to introduce a concept we, we try to work out with colleagues and uh, to be discussed also with the government and the, the donors, which is the concept of concession two zero in Central Africa. And it's about uh, managing and recognizing overlapping rights to new rights. Uh, I'm doing this with two colleagues, one of uh, Cédric Vermelen and Guillaume Lescuyer. Uh, First, you have to, to understand that, uh, unlike Brazil, uh, in Central Africa, uh, concessions are generally extremely large, uh, sometimes uh, around one million hectares or so thousand of, uh, uh, hundreds of thousand hectares minimum. Corning, uh, so is the reason why in Brazil you have some kind of land sparing with concessions with, without any overlapping rights. Uh, it has been designed for, but we cannot, you cannot avoid a situation of land sharing in Central Africa because simply of the size of the concessions that you can see in red here, uh, the magnitude, the extension of concession uh, in, the, in this place. Uh, today, uh, very briefly, we have a double uh, movement of concentration on one, hedge and, uh, uh, on one hand and fragmentation on the other. We have an increasing demographic pressure density uh, in most of the places in Central Africa, that was uh, uh, generally uh, was said to be an empty place. Uh, so you have still some empty places in Gabon and Congo, but it is not really uh, uh, more the case. And the room for large-scale concessions is gra gradually shrinking, exception being essentially Congo, Northern Congo, uh, Gabon, and some places of Cameroon too also. Uh, then, therefore, as a consequence, some concession will be uh, inevitably reduced, dismantled, probably converted to agricultural use at one stage, but also will be transformed into community forests and household lands. But large concession will remain because where in their role, their public role, their role as institutions, uh, 
in structuring remote landscape is key in places where the state is basically absent, where the infrastructures, infrastructures are degraded or non-existent. So there is still a room for those large concessions, not everywhere, but in many places. We are in a, in a situation when you have a lot of public and NGO initiative regarding tenure, regarding rights, and uh, you have new public regulation first, which insists on timber revenue sharing. So uh, now it is more and more common than to have some benefit sharing from the timber revenues with the local communities, with population. It is the case in Gabon, Cameroon, Congo. And you have, uh, you have some provision in, in the new regulation for this. And you have also here, it's a, it's a map from one concession in Northern Congo, some what we call agricultural series or development series within the concession, which is a new movement which uh, is developing, which uh, basic idea is to allow uh, communities based on their rights to develop some agricultural activities with, under the supervision of the concessionaire. And it is also the community development series in Congo, for instance, is also a benefit sharing mechanism and uh, a tool for socioeconomic reinvestment. It is not working extremely well because of difficulties of public, of collective action within communities, but it is, it is quite a, promise, uh, a promising move. Uh, you have also some other initiatives, such as the one of uh, 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 Rainforest Foundation UK, and also Rights and Resource Initiative, who are working for mapping, for recognizing, uh, recognition of first mapping of customary territories and right recognition. Here is a, is a map you, you, can, you can access on, on, the, on the website of the, uh, in, it's in the Democratic Republic of Congo, around Maindombe, of, uh, which, is a, which is a map uh, that has been uh, prepared by local NGOs. Uh, and you see uh, where you have some influence of administrative boundaries, community tenure, Etc. Et Here you can see that you have overlaps. You have overlap with the concessions. Uh, you have uh, some overlap with the concessions which are here in uh, uh, in, uh, in yellow, let's say. And uh, this is a very common situation. And you have also a situation of overlaps, overlapping with a protected area. So it is strange that you have, to have uh, uh, overlapping with the concession, with the, with, uh, with the local, local uh, with the customary territories, and also with the uh, protected area. And this situation is very common. Uh, we, you have some initiative also uh, with uh, private companies, large private companies. This is a case in Gabon, where on uh, 600,000 hectares, you have a concession where all, you have all these lines here, not, not, I don't have any pointer, but you have all these uh, boundaries uh, within the concession that has been mapped, recognized, surveyed, and which are a key for benefit sharing, benefit sharing for the timber revenues. And so it is, it is, it is a FSC certified concession. It is something that now FSC is, is pushing concessionaires to, to do this kind of thing. It is probably one of the most, uh, uh, um, what I can say, uh, emblematic, uh, exemplary uh, situation where you have a map which is available, you can, you, 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 you can display. But it is, it is something new also to have. And you can see that almost all the concession is covered by what we call finage uh, in French, uh, which is uh, the name that is, uh, that is uh, used also in Gabon, which are the, the customary territories where people, local communities, have rights, some rights, some tenure rights, uh, uh, generally. And beyond timber, what is the, the purpose of concession 2.0 will be to develop new commodity chains, because we know that uh, uh, with, but jointly with communities, not to add something new for the concessionaire, but to have, to have some kind of joint ventures, to have something new, and to encourage, uh, for, for the moment, concession, timber concession, are competing with other land use, alternative land use, oil palm, rubber wood, et cetera, et cetera those uh, alternatives are often encouraged by national governments. What an, the evolution will be uh, to, uh, there is an evolution, the evolution will be to, to shift from a mono-exploitation to a broader spectrum of activities, mixing sustainable forest management on one hand, and valorization commercial of non timber forest products, not only by use, but commercial use and, and some specific processing for trying to create new values within the forest and with also with so, so, some, so, some capital to be invested into those activities, which is not also, which is for the time being, it's not allowed for, for the regulation. Public regulation just, in, just give a privilege just to extract, to, to exploit timber and not the other, not the other uh, resources. And the idea will be to develop agroforestry production and even plantation of cocoa or oil palm on degraded land, savanna, because in those 
those large, uh, large concessions, you have a lot of places where you can do agriculture, providing it is in a way which is managed uh, within, within so, some, some land use schemes, etc., and many other things. But this evolution will be acceptable only with the recognition, the previous recognition of the community, uh, community's customary territories, what you call the finage, within the concessions. So the new economic activities will, could be, will be developed jointly with the empowered populations with, on, under the supervision of the concessionnaire and also with external support to develop some new, some new, uh, some new values uh, within the forest. And so this will be to, to move explicitly from a, a land sparing, we see because in the, in the in legislation you still have some land sparing spirit, to uh, really land sharing, to organize, to recognize the overlappings and to manage them. And to have a concession to zero that will move from a hybrid between a company and a territorial institutions. The systematic mapping of finage in, in and outside the concessions and uh, participative management will, will also create room for a new conception of community forestry. Uh, generally, you have this situation where you have a, it, it, in, uh, you have a, you have a finage, you have a, you have a, a, um, a customary territory. One part is overlap, and the uh, the other situation you have community co the community forestry community concession which is outside. In this in this new scenario, you have community forestry which will be in, inside and outside the concession with different privilege, some exclusive privilege in the community forest in, uh, community concession in yellow, but also some, some sharing activities, some joint venture with the concessionaire in the overlapping areas. And uh, we have to, the idea will be to manage overlapping right by layers, so I don't, because I'm short in time, I don't want to, to insist, but timber will remain an exclusive right for concessionaire, we but with benefit sharing, and also some trees can be set aside that it is done in many concession, FSC certified concession, after agreement with population. A lot of things can be developed on the overlapping. Uh, hunting, for instance, can be totally overlap, and there are some experience in, uh, in, the, in the northern Congo on, on this. Investment, investment external will be needed to create joint venture and will be maybe a room for donors to really to support this new institution, this concession to zero to develop new, new values, new activities, and new commodity chain. Payment for metal services can finance timber and firewood plantation on restoration lands, and cash crops can, could be developed with households on degraded lands. The sharing and also the governance should be, should be transformed also to have a, a decision sharing process with the concession assembly with voting rights of the represented communities based on, their, on, the, on the overlapping areas, and also some comité de finage, uh, which more locally set a as a way to discuss specific problems and to prepare joint ventures. And implementation process will remain in the hand of the concessionnaire because uh, we need to have some coherence in the actions of consistency under the supervision of the administration and the concession assembly. And I thank you for that touch I, I hope it's not too... Thank you very much. Alan, thank you very much uh, for your interesting uh, uh, presentation on this latest development of uh, harmonizing concession with uh, other users and uh, benefit sharing. Uh, we have very, very disciplined speakers, actually, so we are well in time, so thank you very much for that, so uh, excellent. Our next speaker is Michael Galante, and he will take us to Southeast Asia um, with the situation there. Michael, please. Thank you, Michael. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael, and I um, will be making this presentation along with, uh, with Robert. So um, the title of the presentation is Managing Tropical Forests in um, an Era of Change. Um, so the session, why production forests? Um, well, globally, uh, production forests account for 30% of, of designated forest types. 24% are, um, are designated for multiple use. Um, you can probably see down in, in the bottom here the... Um, the, the graphic that, that shows the um, distribution. And, and many people are affected, um, uh, uh, of course, in, in, the, in these areas. So if they are sustained and managed, they can continue to produce goods and services. Um, however, um, the maintenance of goods and services are possible only under different um, paradigms and are generally being practiced today, specifically in, in areas designated for, for production. Um, this data comes from the, from the FAO uh, 2015 Forest Resource Assessment, and um, you can see some trends here. So total forest area, um, 
seems to be uh, decreasing um, overall. Um, area of deforestation um, seems to be increasing slightly. The, um, the graph on the, on the top right, total area of primary and, and, and production forests, um, I made a stack diagram to, to demonstrate. Um, you can see some trends, actually. Um, if, if you don't look at 1990 and if you look at the other trends, you can see that the, um, the figures are, are, are relatively even. So that's an indication that um, definitely that um, there's some leveling off or some stagnation. Um, it's, it's too early, of course, the graph is only 15 years uh, in time series. And um, on, the, on, on, the, on the bottom, the area for, for protection and biodiversity is, um, seems to be, the general trend seems to be increasing over time. So you have some positives and some negatives that are, um, that are, that are uh, trends in, in, in forests in Southeast Asia at the moment. So um, more towards uh, insular um, uh, Southeast Asia and, and, and in particular in Borneo, um, you can you can see these um, the trends of, of degradation or forest change um, over time over the past um, 40 years, and um, ironically, uh, 40 years in these type of, of mixed dip dipterocarp forests um, uh, typically is um, what uh, is often discussed in the literature as a harvest cycle, and um, so this is what the the trends of, of what you can see. So. Um, this publication came out last year, and um, log forests, of course, the um, the intact forests, which uh, in this publication are termed as old growth, um, it, it somewhat represents this Heart of Borneo initiative, which is um, which is ongoing, and um, and, I can, and you can see that this is um, uh, the the area outlined is 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 very similar. So, I think the one of the key messages is, is, is what's inside is, is changing. Um, we know that they've been harvested um, at least once, multiple times, and um, they're changing in composition, they're changing in diversity. Um, so, I mean, primary forests are the exception. Um, a bit loud. Primary forests are the exception. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, the traditional approaches to their management needs to be recon re uh, reconsidered. And, and, and with the reconsideration, of course, uh, we need to reconsider how um, we are juggling the environmental and social and economic benefits uh, um, uh, that they provide, of course. So what did we learn? Um, in, in, I guess, uh, in, in over this harvest cycle. Well, we learned that there's a new need for, for, for new management uh, systems for log over forest. Um, the existing ones, um, the, the forest structure to which they were adopted has changed and therefore likely a new system will need to be uh, incorporated. Uh, improved approaches need to, um, need to support the flow of benefits for the multiple actors. We, we heard this multiple times today, uh, the forest biodiversity and also in the context of, of global change itself. And, and, and more needs also need to be learned about the consequences of, of these interventions other than um, what uh, we know as reduced impact logging or more responsible ways of, of harvest activities. So concessions themselves, forest management units, this is the typical uh, name for the, uh, for the concessions. Um, new models need to be, uh, to be created to enable the um, environment for, for better management of the entire of the system um, and all forest types within that. And, and um, well-managed forests represent the middle ground between um, you know, deforestation and total protection. So how is that balance um, how do we find that middle ground uh, while we, you know, using the, the forest for its for its value and also um, for its um, for its uh, economic and other other benefits? Um, so the, the concessions are good. They're, they're a good model to 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 um, 
to devolve timber or forest product rights to operators. I think that the, the, the multiple actors, the things that we discussed um, in, in, in the last presentation specifically about community rights and overlap, um, all of these are now coming to the forefront. So the, the new models must incorporate these into these structures. And um, of course, rather than expecting sustained yield um, without changes in species or quality, emphasis should um, assure production forests remain in the best possible condition for, of course, these, these values. Um, this is my last slide, and uh, you know, what, what I want to, 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 um, to say in this slide is that um, you know, the composition of the forests um, are changing, and, and of course, uh, the diversity found within them. So um, maintaining these multi-tiered uh, structures, it supports the, the ecosystem dynamics for both the integrity and, and the biodiversity of that forest. So this, this infographic that I have here is, um, is a publication talking about um, when you harvest a single species uh, versus whether you, um, you harvest more than one uh, type of species. So in A, you have um, the diversity of, of those harvests. You have same and same plus, um, which talks about the actual amount of volume that is recovered. So in this study, um, you have a higher recovery when you, when, when you, you uh, go for, when you target more than, than one commercial species. And um, one year post logging, of course, you have um, high amounts of, of, of carbon. And, and the biodiversity values tend to, to be relatively stable as well. So th um, these are the, 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 the quick lessons learned that um, I have to share with you today on, on Southeast Asian forests. And um, I hope to hear some questions on this presentation. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much. So now we have more or less uh, completed uh, natural forest management in a very, very short way, natural forest management in, in tropical high forest. Uh, but of course, as you all know, these, are not, uh, these forests are not isolated in the landscape. They are partly under threat because of uh, agricultural development, many different things going on outside these forests, and therefore also the component of landscape restoration, uh, even then in many cases supporting the sustainable management of um, regenerating natural forests are very important. So we have here now uh, one more presentation on um, landscape restoration. And uh, I would like to ask uh, um, John Stanter from US Forest Service and you for lead scientist on that study uh, to start with the presentation, which afterwards be followed by Stephanie Mansurian on uh, landscape restoration and governance, an important component. And she is the um, environmental consultant uh, to UFRO. Please, John. Thank you, Michael. So I want to give you a little background on what we did and some of our ob objectives and to point out that there is a report that will be launched tomorrow at 4.30 and we welcome you to come to our booth in D24, I believe it is, in the D Pavilion and get a free copy. So the background was to realize that climate change policy and forest landscape restoration are really interlinked approaches and they both require that many motivated actors do the right thing at the right time. Our approach to this was to try to develop the scientific basis to support a, a, a better understanding of these linkages, to develop a simple communication product that could be used to show those linkages and the benefits, and then to, that could also be used to jointly evaluate forest landscape restoration initiatives. This was by assembling the best available information on mitigation, adaptation, and transformational activities under climate change. And what we developed was this simple stoplight tool. And I don't, does, yeah, okay, it does show up. I do have sort of a pointer here. So the idea of the stoplight is everybody knows what a stoplight or a traffic light means, even if in some countries we don't obey them. But green means it's okay to go, red means you should stop, and yellow means pay attention. So in the, in the, in a value, in a um, evaluation sort of phase, what's sort of asking the question, where are we? The way that you would interpret that stoplight was, do we have these things in place? Or are they not in place? Or are they underway? Would be yellow. If you're trying to design or prioritize or compare different approaches, it, the stoplight has a little different meaning. And I just wanted to point that out in the beginning. So again, desirable is green, undesirable is red. 
So how did we look at the climate benefits of forest landscape restoration? I have four quick slides. I can't talk about everything that's in the slides, but to give you an overview, we have the, the benefit on this left column, the mechanism of gaining that benefit in the middle, and what is the restoration activity? What is the suite of restoration activities that could be utilized in order to gain that benefit? So we've adopted the um, IPCC notion of separating things into mitigation and adaptation, even though we all realize that those things are interlinked and you really can't separate them. But we're trying to, to follow that, that sort of paradigm. So mitigation then is about sequestering carbon, reducing fossil fuel emissions, reducing, in this case, emissions from biomass burning in, in forests, or reducing emissions from land use change, changing from one land use to another land use that often uh, the disturbance uh, creates opportunities for releasing of, of carbon products into the atmosphere. So just to point out how this works, then the, a mechanism for reducing fossil fuel emissions would be bioenergy. And bioenergy um, in the forest landscape restoration context might in, uh, be to develop firewood or fuel wood plantations within a landscape as part of a, a development project. It could be to improve charcoal production methods from the traditional methods to something that's more efficient, or it could be ways of utilizing forest residues. Switching now to adaptation, we separated adaptation into three approaches to adaptation, and the main difference between the three approaches is sort of how quickly you're adapting to climate change, how quickly you must adapt or how quickly you plan to adapt. So incremental adaptation really means adapting to the current climate. In other words, managing forests and, and restoring forests in a, ways that we know how to do that would make them more climate adapted. Um, in many cases, people that are managing or trying to restore forests have a very limited time frame of understanding of what the climate has been. So they try to restore to the climate that's current today but today's climate may just be an anomaly in a longer term climate sequence. So that's the incremental adaptation. Changing the way we, we restore forests or manage, this could also apply to management of forests, to do a better job of adapting to current climate. Anticipatory adaptation would be, okay, we're going to have changes due to climate, but maybe they're 50 years out, or maybe they're, we're, we're going to start to see those effects today but it's not going to require a wholesale transformation of the landscape. So anticipatory differs from incremental in sort of the forward-looking approach, but it utilizes many of the same techniques, but with differences in the way that those are, are actually used in the, in the landscape. So for example then, adaptation is maintaining forest area, maintaining carbon stocks, differing from mitigation, or maintaining and improving other forest functions. So, to get away from sort of the, the, the uh, traditional forestry approaches to restoration, let's look at some of the other forest functions that could be approved in an adaptive framework, which might be hydrology. So in, in Australia, you have this uh, problem in western areas of Australia where the native forest has been converted to wheatlands. The wheat don't have root systems that go as deep as forest trees do, so there's consequently a rising of the water table, and because it's a semi-arid area, it's increasing the salinity of the surface waters in that area because of the lack of drawdown because of the conversion of the vegetation types. So one way to, to improve other mechanisms or other um, aspects of that ecology in, in that area would be to actually restore native forests, deeper roots, and over time, you might have some impact on the salinity levels. Other areas of adaptation is just reducing the vulnerability. So when you restore, you don't try to restore necessarily to some historic past condition if that condition is not going to be adapted to the current or the future climate. So reducing the vulnerability of your restored forest or landscape is part of this adaptation strategy. So one way to do that, especially in tropical forests, would be to overcome some of the regeneration barriers that, re that um, are problems for using natural regeneration or in, in uh, places where you have 
converted that in, into other land uses or other land cover, you've, you have barriers for recolonization from fragments of native forest into the, agri say, an agricultural area. So reducing the barriers could be by controlling herbivory, controlling the, the uh, livestock or even the native species, the native mammals that are eating the regener eating the, the, the seedlings as they develop, or it might be by uh, reestablishing uh, re connectivity between fragments. I have one minute, so let me go on to transformation. Transformation then is really farther out there. It says, okay, we're gonna have climate change. We're in a, a, an area where the climate is going to change drastically over the foreseeable future, certainly over the lifetime of the, f of the main species and the restored forests. So what we wanna do is bring in species or provenances of, of species from other areas that are going to be more adapted to the future climate. Admittedly, this is somewhat controversial, but this may be something that we'll be facing in some areas relatively soon. And to give you an example of that would be ecosystems with novelty, replacing native species with non-natives that have the same desirable functional traits as the native species. So you still have the ecosystem benefits. And I'm finished. Okay, I'm going to talk about governance, as Michael said, in the context of forest landscape restoration, um, to follow on from John with the idea of uh, looking at climate mitigation and uh, climate adaptation. So governance determines who takes decisions and how those decisions are taken and applied. Um, UNEP defines environmental governance as the rules, practices, policies, and institutions that shape how humans interact with the environment. So how does governance relate to forest landscape restoration? Well, forest landscape restoration is, is a process um, that takes a certain amount of time, and governance influences different stages of that process. So for example, early on in the process, it might be critical to engage all the key stakeholders and to provide a forum where they can actually um, express their views and their needs and their desires from the restoration. Later on in the process, it might be more important to look at policies that ensure the sustainability of the restoration effort. I'll just quickly um, review five, uh, five of the many reasons why governance is important in, in forest landscape restoration. So the key one is that unless we understand the root causes of uh, forest loss and degradation, restoration is unlikely to, to succeed. Um, and many, more and more, we're understanding that um, a lot of these uh, root causes of um, forest loss and degradation are, in fact, governance failures. Another reason why um, uh, governance is important to forest landscape restoration is that new value is generated. So by changing the landscape, by returning trees that have a value, by returning trees with fruit on them that are of value to different people, uh, by improving the, the soil, by improving the land, by capturing carbon, this new value is generated. And unless there's appropriate governance arrangements, this new value that's generated co can cause conflict and um, issues within the landscape. Another reason why governance is important is that there may be competing, there are frequently competing land uses in a landscape. So again, by returning trees, um, depending on the reason why those uh, trees are returned to the landscape, depending on who's decided how those trees are returned and for what purpose, um, there might be some lost opportunities for other groups. So for example, mining or food production um, is a competing land use when you're looking at restoring um, forest landscapes, amongst many others. So unless governance arrangements are clear here as well, that this could lead to conflict and the lack of sustainability of the restoration effort. Tenure and rights, um, I won't say much about that because I last spoke very um, eloquently about some of the issues there. Um, but again, it's something that's critical for, for restoration and for the sustainability of the effort. Um, scaling up, increasingly forest landscape restoration is, is one of the many approaches at looking at restoration at a bigger scale. 
Um, and as soon as you are looking at a bigger scale, you're looking at different sectors, you're looking at different actors, and therefore increased complexity. Landscapes as well don't happen to match very neatly with political um, levels. So that also adds to governance challenges within um, restoring forests in a landscape. A final word, um, if we are to achieve climate benefits, many of the underlying causes of deforestation and forest degradation need to be removed or at least altered in ways that allow restoration activities to occur and to be sustainable. And many of those underlying causes represent governance challenges. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you very much. Stephanie and also John, thank you very much. So this was the, the final uh, presentation. So we have heard a lot of information, a lot of uh, concepts now in a, in a rather short time, a lot of food for thought and debate. And with this, I would like to um, open the discussion and would like to hand over to uh, my colleague Barbara Livorel from the Foundation for Research on Biodiversity. She is a knowledge broker working mainly and this is also for the International Union of Forest Research Organizers, a very, very important field to work at the interface between the forest science, forest science community, policymaker, and practitioners. So how information, scientific information, can travel to practitioners and to implementation. I would like to ask Barbara to take over this moderation. Thank you, Michael. Well, I hope you've prepared a lot of questions. Just before we start, a um, few housekeeping requirements. We have normally a translator in the room. Could uh, I make sure? Any translator in the room? Oh, behind, no. Well, anyway, um, normally there is one. Okay, okay. Uh, is it French, English, or can we include Spanish? I see on the panel here. No, no Spanish. Okay, I see you above. Thank you. In the sky. All right. <laughs> so please feel free to ask your questions in, in English or French. And then obviously the translator will help. Um, so raise your hand and let's start. As possible, as, um, if possible, keep your questions very short so that we could take as many of them as possible. So I see one first hand here. Um, I can bring... It works, no? Yes, yeah, so I will, I will try like that. So thank you very much for all the nice presentations. Uh, I would have one question for Alain Carsanti on this uh, new uh, model for the concessions uh, in, in the Congo Basin. Uh, isn't it a bit uh, dangerous to uh, give so many responsibilities to the forest concessionaires and also like quite far from their main... Uh, domain, like uh, now we are talking about uh, agroforestry, uh, hunting, um, uh, non-timber forest products and so on. So what is a bit uh, the plan? And also, have you discussed that with the concessionaires there and how did they react? And also uh, another question would be about the role of uh, replanting, like uh, in the tropical forests, uh, like is it like now common uh, practice? to replant after harvest, or is it something like a bit out, outside the debate currently? Thank you. Yeah, preci <coughs> yeah precisely, I think um, the, the key condition to increase the capacity of the concessionaire, not the concessionaire, but the concession, the concession itself as more uh, a shared institution, should be to have first this recognition of rights, of the new rights. Then to just only accept a new activity only upon the condition that you have a new joint venture created uh, with the concessionaire, a third party that could be another operator can for hunting, for instance, or for developing agroforestry, because the concessionaire has not all the skills. And the households represent, or, the, or the community or households, which are based on the finage on the, on, the, on the territory. This is the only condition, otherwise, we are going to, to get back to the concession of the, uh, of the 19th century, where, uh, where people who had all the rights on the territory, and who, I really want to avoid these kind of things. 
We recently had a, with the, within the FLAIR conference uh, last week in Paris uh, a discussion with many, with some donors and some concessionaires. Concessionaires are interested because they start to do this, but they, they, they are hesitating to, to, to go further. Uh, what they, they, lack, they lack confidence for the time being uh, on, the, uh, on the capacity of collective action of organization of the communities. But this is something that can be reinforced uh, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with some support, external support of NGOs and so far. And we have to start somewhere. Okay. Je vois qu'on me demande de m'arrêter. Donc... Conrado Surber, Interandes, Peru. I am addressing to Isabel about Brazil. And first, uh, how much percentage of forest land is certified in the Amazonian region? Secondly, tell us about uh, precious wood in Brazil. I, I think they have a half a million hectares under management. Uh, the experience of them, if it's uh, to be replied in other countries as well, Peru. Thanks. So um, um, the amount of uh, certified forest, natural certified forest in Brazil, it's uh, it's a little, little bit. It's uh, because we have uh, we have millions of uh, for natural forests. Uh, not all um, are still uh, put into production. So there are there uh, there are national forests. There are private lands forested but they are not able to to be put in production so the the amount of 1.6 million it's it's really a, a few few amount uh, about precious woods uh, i don't know uh, I, I i don't have too much to uh, to say i know that mil madeiras that was uh, precious woods is certified in a, in a smaller area now uh, and it's a it's a good example of forest man certified forest management, but with a lot of challenges to fulfill the FSC standards also, social challenges, economic challenges. So it's that's a, as as far I know. Sorry. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I have a question to Alain Carsanti and a question to the before last speaker. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Choose one. <laughs> Do I have to? Okay. So, um, in in the last option that you presented, which was using new species and introducing them uh, based on the future uh, potential landscapes or ecosystems, this is something that's being done with the climate analogs and with um, with agriculture. Uh, species. So I, I was just curious to know if using the climate analogs and projections in terms of scenarios of shifting landscapes and ecosystems would be at the basis of that uh, of that option. If we have time, we have the yes, actually, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Actually, there there's three sort of levels of the species translocation or species migration. One is to just extend the species within its native range. So to other sites within its range, that's more incremental. The next step would be to expand the range. So it, the difference is how far you move the species. OK, so the next step would be to expand the, the native range, so into new areas. And this is going on in some, some uh, countries already. For example, in China and, and in Canada, they're all, already doing this. Uh, and what they're doing is finding provenances of those species that are more adapted that are reasonably adapted to the current conditions and will be better adapted to the future conditions. The last thing that I showed is this, this really uh, long-range species translocation. And the only example of that that I really know about is a private one in uh, Florida where they're, they're, it's a relic conifer in North Florida. You know, it's a leftover from the last uh, paraglacial climate. And they're moving it up into the lake states, up, in, up into the, almost to the boreal area. So that's a, a very large change. And this is, this is quite um, controversial, as you can imagine. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of this, especially with endangered mammal species uh, in, the, in biological conservation. And some of that discussion is being carried over into plant conservation. So it, to directly go to your question about using these species analogs, uh, that's OK for, I think, the first two steps 
of migration because those analogs are based on what we know about the species adaptation. We don't really know the full range of the full plasticity of, of species adaptation to climate. We only know what we have ex the climates that we have experienced and have information about. The long range migration is, is still, um, we, we, we don't know enough about that and would probably have to be based on more on functional traits than, than on climate analogs. Thank you. Next question. Hello, Benjamin Singer from the United Nations Forum on Forests. And I have a question for uh, uh, Alain Kersanti, who uh, introduced a, a, a very new and exciting model for uh, concessions in Central Africa. Um, my, my question is, uh, where would the impetus um, for change towards this new model come from? Uh, do you see it as coming from uh, official development assistance or foreign aid? Do you see it coming through certification, through changes in national regulations, or through just the, the, the goodwill of concessionaires? Yes, thank you. Well, you uh, it's a good question. The, the point is, I think there is, a, there is already uh, something on track. There is a momentum. Uh, because you have more and more claims of people. And when I presented this uh, new initiative by, by big NGOs, Rainforest Foundation and Right and Resource Initiative, uh, this is, there, is so, there is something new. And once people have a map, uh, th things are totally different. And uh, we cannot go back to a situation where you can ignore the fact that you have some, some right, even they are, if they are not legalized, not politically recognized, they are, th the fact that you have a map is already a political recognition. And I think there is an irreversibility into, into this change. Now, the question will be whether we want to have a, a conflict, a zero-sum game, with a new community forestry, for instance, community forest, that what you are going to, to, you are going to what will be lost by the concessionaire will, will, be, will be won by the, by, by, the, by the farmer or the opposite? Or can we have a positive-sum game where we will really go for a new paradigm of management of landscape, which is not land, uh, no more land, land sparing, but really uh, managing the overlaps. And based on the fact that in all places, locations, land is really made on, on overlapping rights. And this is something where you, can have, you cannot have purely, uh, totally, you cannot exclude the other rights, even in, in our Western countries we have some overlapping rights and so, and so on. And so there is no, no room for an absolute uh, uh, private property, for instance, because you have many times you have some rights, you have some, some other use that are overlapping, and we have really to manage this. And I think this is a modern way of managing landscape, not the old way which was about land sparing. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. I think uh, thank you. Kasper Wanslim from the Forestry and Climate Change Fund, an impact investing fund. And this question is to Michael on the experience in Southeast Asia. You were saying that if you're faced with these heavily intervened forests, we, we need to rethink the models in which we uh, do uh, manage natural forests. And I, I, was, I was wondering whether you could expand that a little bit. Yeah, thank you for your question. Good question. Um, I think when, 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 when we explain uh, um, models, uh, um, it's, it's what the starting point is. And, and traditionally, the starting point was, um, was primary forests. That condition is, is completely changed now. The whole diversity has changed. The, 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 um, the amount of eligible area, uh, uh, volume, um, which is eligible to be, to be extracted has changed, and so that model needs. We need to to rethink our strategy approaches to to uh, approaching forest management and 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 what we consider is um, sustainable and what values we have to look at other values and how they can also um, uh, assist to to not only look at just the timber value but um, non timber values, uh, biodiversity, water, carbon, and all the other. Um, values that were looked at. Does that answer the question? Or are you looking for a concrete model? Yeah. Yep. Just to chain over the same range of questions, I, I am not in my field, I am a geneticist, so uh, forgive me if I don't use all 100% uh, 
correct terms. But I, I have a, I, I, I didn't hear speaking about the state forests. Uh, if you look at, so, and, and we are speaking about changing paradigm, right? So, meaning uh, that we, we see that the currently paradigm doesn't work, so we have to move. In the, in the first uh, map that you presented, there is uh, two colors, red and uh, green. In the temperate uh, area, it's quite green in terms of deforestation. In the, in the tropical area, it's quite red. What is the main difference in my, for my training and my knowledge? In the, <clears throat> in the greener region, in the temperate region, you have uh, state forests, meaning that they are not given in concession. They are managed by the state, right? So I, I, I know that uh, you, well, but I have the question, uh, why, why we have to take uh, as a granted that 100% uh, uh, of the forest are given in concession, sometimes uh, 1 million hectares in concession? I mean, uh, for, a, for a de Fontainebleau, uh, the, the, the forests in the Alps that are quite uh, sustainable, if you permit, they are not uh, given in concession to 1 million hectares. So maybe this is one of the topics and uh, I would like to speak about it. Thank you, ma'am. Who would like to answer? Sorry. Uh, well, I think that the cause of deforestation is not about a state forest or private forest. I think that the rate of deforestation is mainly a link to the, uh, um, to the uh, system of development of uh, the country. The, the economic system uh, right now is to deforest, to plant oil palm or, uh, or pasture. And uh, most of the, of the country in, in North Hemisphere has, have already entered what we call their forest transition. What is forest transition is when you have very low forest, we have a, you have deforested a lot, and then uh, you start your transition First transition means that you're planting tree and you are restoring the forest. This happened in France in the 18th uh, century, uh, and it happened in most of the country of Europe and also North America. Uh, now, this has not happened yet in most of the tropical countries. It might happen uh, to Brazil if uh, they manage to reach a zero deforestation. Uh, and the main challenge, for example, for Brazil will be to do this uh, forest transition while still having uh, several hundred millions of primary forest, which is actually not the case in our country. We have made our transition forest um, without uh, keeping any hectares of uh, primary forest. And this is all the challenge in the tropic, is to uh, reach the, the transition, um, the forest transition, while keeping uh, primary or at least uh, natural forest in, in good shape. So uh, in most of the tropical country, uh, the, the forest is still managed by the state, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, is a guarantee to uh, stop deforestation. Thank you. Next question, yeah. Hello, um, my name is Natalie, and I did research in Indonesia last year. Um, one of the things I came across in restoration areas was um, villagers had economic incentives to not allow the trees to grow, essentially. They would accidentally release their animals um, or trees would die. And the reason is so that they could get the fuel wood as well as um, allow the open area so that they could actually grow crops there. Um, I guess, are there any examples that you've seen um, restoration projects use that give economic incentive to local communities around the forest so that they don't um, actively destroy the, re uh, the like, uh, the reforestation activities, and um, could you elaborate on that? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's exactly the, uh, the issue that, that Stephanie and I have talked about, is that if the local communities are not invested in, or empowered to be part of the restoration effort, it will eventually fail for, in exactly the ways you talk about accidentally reducing livestock, accidentally letting fire escape, that sort of thing. And there are also other government level perverse incentives to, to do away with forests. 
the examples would be what this, this whole effort for more participatory management of forest lands or, and landscapes, community forests, joint forest management areas. There's, there's many uh, varieties of things like this that are participatory and they fit within the local context. Some of them are not very successful because they're not really participatory. It's only participatory in, in name. But in reality, I think that's, that's the only way that, that restoration in the future will be successful and sustainable. I had a few more minutes, so I thought of a couple of examples. <laughs> um, in Madagascar, for example, there are projects for restoration where the communities are actually paid. So they're paid either in cash or they're paid by being given seedlings to plant. They're being trained. So there's a, a whole series of incentives to try and both make them restore, but also make them understand um, the value of restoration, make them feel that it's of use to them, make them um, choose the, the sorts of species they want to use. So there's quite a lot of work there. Um, another example that I don't know enough about, but uh, there are several examples like in Morocco, restoring cork oak forest so where you can benefit then from, the, from harvesting the cork. So there are lots of ways of, of making it more positive. But yes, I mean, as John said, it depends how it's approached and um, what the prevailing policy environment is and what, how the project was initiated, if it's top down, if, if people are engaged from the start, if, if people understand, if those initiating the project understand what people want out of the restored landscape. Um, so that they can actually benefit from it and therefore maintain it, because that's the, the key is maintaining, as, as you quite rightly pointed out. That's often the problem. Thank you. There's one question in the back. Hi. So, My question is to Isabel. Um, going beyond a bit uh, f uh, from the FSC certification, I would like to know if you have a number of the sawmills in the Amazon that are actually certificated, and what are the strategies that FSC has to promote certification throughout the whole supply chain of the wood because I, sometimes I think it's quite a problem that many concessionaires and private landholders, they have certification, but the sawmills in the Amazon, they don't, they kind of refuse to buy if they have FSC certificate or they don't want to get certificate because they think that the wood won't, certified wood won't have too much value in the market after that. So I would like to know your opinion about it. Thanks. So, okay, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have a, a number of uh, certified sawmills in Amazon. I know uh, each uh, certified company in Amazon uh, has your own sawmill. Uh, in forest concession, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a requirement of the contract. So they have to invest and to build a sawmill to process uh, the, the timber. Uh, the FSC strategy to, um, to expand the FSC certification in sawmills is not clear. <laughs> uh, I know it's not clear for, for Brazil uh, uh, because uh, they, they are trying to promote, uh, to, to promote information, to, um, to expand uh, uh, the sawmill certification uh, going, and to the, uh, going to the regions. Is speaking to these people, but it's really it's a problem of to, to pay. It's not a willing to pay more for, for the timber in the domestic market. So I think this is the, the most problem. It, it, we have to, uh, to find another types of incentives to do that. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, next question in the front. Hello, uh, this is Red Harrison from ICRAF. Um, I'm thinking that a big difference in moving from what we've thought of as traditionally as sustainable forest management and forest landscape restoration is the fact that the the value that you're the resource that you're looking at is essentially got a very is down to a low level because it's been logged it's been cleared and so the business model that you have to develop in order to restore value in the landscape is a very different one you're not you're not just cutting a, a high value capital resource that exists. And in, in this respect as well, in trying to meet and align the objectives of the different stakeholders, it becomes also very complicated because different 
stakeholders can wait for different lengths of time, for example, for the timber to grow back. And I just wondered if, I mean, all of you are experts on this, what your thoughts were on the financial mechanisms that might make this happen. <laughs> I think this is preci precisely why <clears throat> maybe we have to, for the, for the next filling cycle, really uh, not only to wait for 30 years, but really to try to, to combine, uh, to, to create new commodity chains with respect to sustainable management. Uh, in any case, it will be extremely challenging, I, I, I do admit. Uh, but uh, it's the same with agroecology, uh, for instance, uh, have, uh, having a, when, you, when, when you make a tilling, when you, after tilling, you, during, uh, if, you, if you leave uncovered your land for, uh, for maybe six months, it is, it is a lack, of, uh, it is a lack of, uh, of productivity because you, 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 you don't create the photosynthesis. I think we have to apply the same reasoning to the, to, to the forest management. We have really to exploit the possibility, uh, the possibility uh, within the rotation, uh, within the filling cycle, to really to new, create new commodity chain, to, so to increase the value. It might not be enough. It might not be enough. And then you say you have we have many stakeholders with multiple expectations. Then I think we have to also to, to think about some financial mechanism to maybe to support these new activities and to, to make this sustainable, to have new business model. Uh, on one hand, with the market, but also we can, we can accept to have payment from rental services based on some taxes you can collect uh, from, uh, it will be a transfer of uh, of uh, of means of financial means from uh, from one sector to, to, to another it will be simply a matter of transfer but i think we are legitimate really to 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 um, to found to have public funding like uh, with incentives as you, as you said for having this act new activities to be successful because without support i i doubt it will be it will, it will be possible it will not it will not be very easy to have some success story without any public su support at the beginning to create the new commodity chains, the market, and so on. Next question. Yes. yes. Talk some more Hello? About that one, yeah, please. please. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, um, I did uh, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, well, just a minute. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to say was, is in, in the context of, of, of forests designated for, for, for production, um, one of the main reasons why I said in that, if you recall the slide about the, the three different uh, time periods of Borneo, um, that, that, that's a 40-year time period, and that 40 years represents supposedly a, a, uh, the return of, of uh, the regeneration of the forest, which would allow uh, a second harvest or to re-enter. And if, if, if that's what's happening in, in 40 years' time, um, do you th obviously the model needs to change. And so what, what I was trying to get at is that we have to maintain what we have currently and, and like you said, you know, re keep uh, the stocks as they are and try to, to, to um, you know, keep all the balls in the air, so to speak, you know, all the, all the, all the, uh, the different values as well as, as maintain um, its productive and... Uh, um, it's productive uses, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to take a little different tack and say that looking at it from the investor side, of people who have the money, who are willing to invest, there's really two things they're going to look at. One is the return on investment, which has a time factor, and the other is risk. And I think if you have a very degraded site that has no assets, it's going to take a long time to restore, and the communities are not empowered and not involved and don't have the capacity to be involved, you have low return on investment and high risk. And that's where I think governments and quasi-governmental organizations have to be the financing partners. At the other end of the scale, if you have some assets, if the communities have a capacity to to participate in management and to respond to questions about benefit sharing and, and all of these other issues that are, that are part of, of, of Alan's uh, new concession style, then you have probably a reasonable return on investment and you have very low risk. I mean, you, you still have risk from wildfire and climate and all the other things that, that people factor in, but you don't have the risk of the local communities going against your, your project. So somewhere in between, I think we're, we're looking for public-private partnerships. 
and I think that's a very hot topic, and there's, I think there's several sessions actually uh, this weekend on new financing mechanisms. Did you want to? No? Okay. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yes. Thank you for your question. Monica Di Gregorio from the University of Leeds. Um, I was wondering what you thought about, and you started addressing that in your answers, the role of the state, because we've heard a lot about private concessions and communities, uh, but we've also seen that, uh, we know that uh, after you log over, although you have nice, rich secondary forests, what often happens is that states at different levels give out concessions for conversion into agriculture, and then you, then you lose the forest. That's number one. So and that's where governance actually, I think, becomes really important. So what do you think is the role of the state? The other important role of the state is to actually protect the rights of communities, because leaving concessionaires to deal alone with communities, we've seen it in a lot of countries. What happens is the community lose out because they don't have the power to assert their rights, even if they have maps. Um, and so there is a very important role, I think, for the state to play uh, in order to balance power. I wanted to know what you think about that. Thank you, yes. Um, for sure, with increased decentralization, there is much more talk about community empowerment and, and the fact that communities do need to be much more engaged. But the role of the state remains really important in setting the policy context, um, as well as working with communities, as well as enforcing uh, where necessary and monitoring and making sure that commitments are actually being met. Um, it's also got a role in adapting, um, having an overview and as a, as a monitoring entity um, as well in helping adapt where things aren't going well. So there definitely remains a role for the state, but I think over time it has changed and it, it will continue to change. I, I just wanted to add uh, another factor. I think in, in many countries, the, the state doesn't have the capacity. The, the state agencies are underfunded. Corruption is rife. Uh, there are issues with elite capture and all the other things that get in the way of communities being able to assert their rights. So it's, it's not just the state has a role, but the state also has to have some capacity development. And I think that, that in my personal view, many of the, the um, development uh, community projects, those sorts of things, have to go more towards a payment for performance basis rather than a granting basis on, on sustainable development so that you hold the state responsible for producing in order to get the tranche of money. And that will, that will force a, a change in, in the state agencies and make them more receptive to participatory management and, and sustainability. So the role of the state will be to, to make provision to, to decide where he wants the forest to be to, to be to be uh, to be kept on the territory without any uh, any policy to, to to say we want to uh, we want to have forests whatever whatever the use whatever it is a productive use a conservation use what is called a permanent forest estate where without this framework it will be impossible to have this work because in uh, you have an opportunity cost even for doing this uh, this kind of activities even if if you have a new concession to zero with timber secondary species and also the other commodities it will be more profitable each time to make an oil palm to make an, an oil palm concession so the role of the state will be key for 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 first to design where he wants the forest to be kept in the future. So I think it's a, it, it, it's a, basic, a basic requirement. And then when the state is not so much corrupt, that much corrupted, so sometimes it's better but also to, to see what are the contracts which are taken, which, which are signed by, uh, by and w what kind of relationship develop within the communities and the concessionaire for these new activities, I think. Thank you. There is one question from over there. Yes, please go. I am Leonard Jungmann, a freelance consultant. Um, we have talked a lot about managing and restoring natural tropical forest. And I believe that the second part of the title of this is 
the crucial thing that is ensuring a sustainable flow of benefits for the people. What I have heard most here is sort of sharing. Well, we'll give them a share. But we haven't talked about the whole value chain. Do you call it filière in, in, in French? You know, having these people involved all the way to the consumer. I think that that is crucial to, to making them really having a benefit enough to ensure that we succeed in restoring the forest. Yeah, it's true, but you, you have a... You have, in fact, you have two types of, of concessions uh, in, my, in my scheme and, in a, and also you have the community concessions, which are people, where people have exclusive rights and they are developing, they, they can go for uh, commodity chain, timber commodity chain, filière, the bois d'oeuvre. Uh, and uh, so it is something that is not working well in Central Africa. Because it is uh, because for issues of governance, issues of collective action, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. it is extremely uh, community forestry has been extremely disappointing in Cameroon, for instance, and it is why we are looking for a solution where we still admit that people should have must have some exclusive rights and create new commodity chains, even for timber, on exclusive areas where probably with some association with industrials, if they want to, they will be free to, to have this kind of associations, but also to have new commodity chain based on non-timber forest products that could be various within in a share in, on share areas, on share spaces where you can have, you can imagine, but also commer commercial, uh, com commercial um, uh, commercial commodity chain, not only use right, because use right are recognized everywhere, but it's not enough to create new values. And so this is exactly the, the, the type of point we would like to address to, to create this new commodity chain. This uh, uh, within and outside the concession on exclusive and inclusive in inclusive areas. Thank you. Um, there's going to be a last question, I think, uh, because time I Time is flying, so please. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to pick up on my initial question. It builds up a little bit on what you just said, and it's addressed to Alain Carsanti. Um, in your last slide, where you were presenting the different models and the different stratifications, it struck me that, in fact, everything that has already intrinsic value is allocated to, concessionaire, to concessionaires and that the communities end up in the marginal lands, which I find is a little bit um, opposite the whole discourse of, of rights and community-based development and community, um, you know, and community involvement in the management of natural resources. So I wonder if this is just an impression from the communication in the slide, or if it's something that you're really proposing? No, first of all, uh, first of all, the, the non-timber forest products, there is no commodity chain. So what I, what I suggest we do to create in the, for the benefits of the, of the local people first, uh, some new commodity chain. It's just the response I made to, the, uh, to, to, to our colleague here. Second point is that in some places in Central Africa, you have no room enough to have some exclusive rights for communities. But we have a tool. This tool is a gazetting. In Cameroon, when the government decided to gazette, classement in French, to gazette the concession, forest management units, they had to go on the field to discuss with the farmers, with the communities. And very often, as a result of the process, the boundaries of, of the concession has been moved to make room for uh, for either community forest or for agricultural land for communities. So the other part of the strategy will be also to have a general gazetting process, which has been, uh, which is totally uh, incomplete in Cameroon, uh, and it, that, but has been already under, under, undertook and, and, and create some rooms for new community forest and new agricultural land, has not been undertaken yet in Congo Brazzaville, in Gabon, and to have this kind of negotiation to see where we can design some uh, exclusive area for community concession, where they will have enough space and hectares 
and not only degraded land, but also some uh, the, but also so, some some places where there is still some timber to to to, to trade, uh, and this will be a process. And I think this is uh, this is why gazetting and to have because gazetting is really to to establish the rule of law within the forestry sector. It is not done yet in many countries, and it is an agenda we have uh, we, we we have to we have to to pay attention to. Thanks a lot. I would like to thank the audience for raising very interesting questions. Uh, I would like to thank the translator uh, for having done a great job. I didn't hear you, but it was very fast, and I know how difficult it is. And I would like to thank the panel for being here today and answering these questions. Thanks a lot, and have a good meeting.